Good afternoon from Brussels. Um, before we start, I just want to make sure that uh, you can hear us well, Ambassador. I can hear you perfectly well. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Fantastic. Uh, it's two o'clock sharp, so I think we can start. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm Martina Biljukevic. I'm head of East Stratcom Task Force, the team behind the EU versus Disinfo project. And it's my great, great pleasure and honor um, to moderate the discussion with uh, Mr. Mati Masikas, EU ambassador to Ukraine. Very warm welcome to you, ambassador. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Uh, thank you for taking the time. Um, so, dear audience, the, the way we would like to spend this one hour with you is um, I'm going to ask a few questions to Ambassador, um, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, so if you want to ask a question to, to Ambassador Masikas, uh, there will be such an opportunity in, in a few minutes. Um, but before we do that, uh, let's kick off. And Ambassador, I would like to start with a question about... Uh, well, how does it feel to be back in Kiev right now? You returned about a month ago. You raised the EU flag again over the delegation's building. How does it feel to be there again? In, in diplomacy, the value added comes from the presence. Almost all value added comes from the presence. And uh, I feel like uh, being where I have to be. Uh, here. My job is here. My job is to is to interact with the Ukrainian counterparts, uh, and that's what I'm doing. Of course, the um, situation in Kiev, which is a, a capital of a country at war, is is tense, but, but uh, the government is fully functioning, and we can do our job. And I understand you are very, very busy these days, and we're going to talk about um, that as well. But before we do that, I also want to want to ask you about kind of the spirit on the ground right now, because what we are seeing from afar is really unprecedented resilience of the Ukrainian people and their bravery that really keeps inspiring us. Uh, how do you see that in your daily work, and how, how do you think Ukrainians uh, keep it up? Indeed. One of the huge miscalculations by the Kremlin was to underestimate the Ukrainian resilience, the Ukrainian willingness to defend their country and also uh, their means, including um, including uh, from uh, international uh, assistance uh, to do so. Um, nobody in Kiev be before, before 24th of February doubted that Ukrainians will fight back and they will fight back fiercely. Ukrainians love their country and and they definitely do not want to be the Kremlin's vassal. Now uh, there are there are several elements to this Ukrainian resilience bar uh, patriotism. Uh, Ukrainians are very creative. And they have they have uh, proven that now on the on the battlefield, and it is some sort some sort of the Cossack mentality, and not the Cossack mentality in terms of uh, hey let's go and fight the Sultan, but the Cossack mentality in terms of the community must manage uh, on its own. Uh, the Ukrainians are not looking at the higher authority, a Tsar somewhere up there. Uh, they they know that they need to manage on their own, and and that's uh, what they have shown now on the battlefield, being very creative. That's what they are also showing uh, on the domestic front. Uh, you, not only the Ukrainian government is functioning, but the Ukrainian local municipalities are functioning as is the almighty Ukrainian civil society, and that's how they are resisting and. The uh, the leadership of President Zelensky enjoys enormously high approval ratings. So this all then again uh, underpinned by the weapons deliveries by by Ukraine's international partners. Uh, this all forms this resilience. Yes, indeed, being together as a community and, and leadership uh, that we are now witnessing is something that we can certainly also get inspiration from. Um, Ambassador, you mentioned the web deliveries, um, and I also want to 
touch upon that uh, in a bit broader context, perhaps. Um, so weapons deliveries is obviously something that Ukraine needs very much and that the EU and international partners are delivering. Uh, but can you give us a few more examples of the support on the ground for Ukraine? The EU and other international partners are helping Ukraine finance this resilience or resistance. Uh, Ukrainian um, monthly budgetary gap is around five billion dollars. And uh, just to, to give you the proportion, the Ukrainian normal normal Ukrainian state budget was around 55, 56 billion. Um, dollars. So, so you, okay, you can you can get the you can get the idea. Uh, the EU uh, President von der Leyen of the European Commission uh, three days ago announced a nine billion macrofinancial assistance package. That's exactly to help Ukraine to uh, to bridge that budgetary gap. Uh, of the United States um, recently announced or approved. 40 billion dollar package if i'm not mistaken 20 billion uh, comes in budgetary as budgetary support um this is definitely definitely one area humanitarian assistance uh, that the eu has supported with 150 million so far and more uh, may may come all and i'm i'm very proud of the european union um you are well aware that words um, quickly and flexible and alike uh, are not always associated with the European Union, but uh, the EU, the European Commission, was able very quickly within, if I'm not mistaken, 10 days um, to take the decision to allow our projects uh, in Ukraine, our yearly assistance stands at around 200 million euro. Allowed all those projects to repurpose their uh, their funding to support Ukraine's resilience. So that means uh, that the uh, that the EU anti-corruption initiative, one of our flagship projects, who uh, that that uh, still in early February fought corruption and uh, and bring brought to account corrupt judges suddenly in early march they started buying uh, buying bulletproof vests and helmets uh, to judges among them also some of whom they had accused in in being corrupt so so the eu has been has been able to has been able to react uh, not only generously but also flexibly Thank you, Ambassador. I'm also wondering, and this may be relevant to, to, to our listeners here, and uh, from what I can see uh, from the accounts that, that joined this conversation, um, listeners come from, from different corners of the world. So I was wondering um, if there is something you can advise, you can tell us about the support um, that each and every one of us can now provide to Ukraine. Of course, when we are talking about EU support and international partner support, this is a different story. But on a very individual level, is there anything that we could do at this point, you think? Oh, yes. there. Are, especially in the countries that are close geographically to Ukraine, when there are, when there are uh, a lot of Ukrainian refugees, uh, um, you all can help them. Uh, but also, um, there are... Um, uh, there are abilities to support uh, with bank transfers several different Ukrainian uh, initiatives and in particular Ukrainian non-governmental organizations. Uh, sometimes sometimes people are wondering oh if I if I if I give money to the to a government or to a government organization, where would that end up? If you if you want to be if you want to be sure, uh, take any of the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian uh, NGOs. Uh, there are plenty of them out there, and you'll 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 you'll, you'll get you'll get what to support. I wouldn't be myself if I didn't add here that there are also fantastic Ukrainian fact checkers and journalists that that can also benefit from from this support. 
Um, Ambassador, if, if you allow, I would like uh, to ask you a bit of a personal question. Um, you are operating in extremely, extremely hard circumstances these days. And uh, what I would like to ask you is uh, what, what motivates you? How, how do you keep going and how do you keep your, your staff going also, given how difficult it is right now on the ground in Ukraine and given what you are seeing and witnessing every day? Uh, first of all, Everybody who is not on the bombs and bullets are having it easy these these days still. So we are having it still relatively easy here here in Kiev, and we've been motivated by uh, Ukrainian the Ukrainian spirit. We are motivated by we see that Ukrainians are fighting back and are doing that successfully. We are motivated by the way that the Ukrainian civil service and authorities function. To give you one example, uh, President von der Leyen handed over to President Zelensky on the 8th of April a questionnaire. Uh, that's a document to, to inform the Commission's opinion on Ukraine's EU application. And uh, she said, we appreciate your responses by the 6th of May. Well, the Ukrainians were able to respond uh, by the 18th of April. So more than, uh, more than two weeks earlier. And if you see that your counterparts work like that, that motivates us as well. Of course, a few of us are in Kiev, and that, of course, complicates things. Um, many colleagues uh, work still uh, telework from the mm, from different different EU countries, but I must say the delivery. I'm really proud of my my team. The delivery is almost as if they were here. Thank you for sharing that, Ambassador. Um, I also want to ask you uh, a bit of a difficult question, I think, uh, and something that, that has been on, on our minds here in East Stratcom Task Force as well. Uh, right now, all eyes are on Ukraine, um, and uh, the support comes from different corners of the world, which is obviously fantastic. Um, however, what, what worries us is that, uh, and let's hope, of course, the war is going to end as soon as possible, um, very, very soon, hopefully. Um, but if the war drags on, it will become more and more difficult to keep the world's attention on it. Um, I was wondering if you, if you have any thoughts on this and uh, how, how to work against this, how to keep Ukraine uh, always at the highest political point on the agenda. You are quite right, Martina. That is what unfortunately happens. Uh, such is the human nature. Man as a species is a very adaptable, uh, adaptable species, uh, and and gets used to quite quickly to 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 many things, and we can already see how the how the news related to a reporting of the war in Ukraine are a bit a bit not on a back burner but on, are a bit. Uh, not so prominent as uh, as previous. Here, of course, uh, the combination of responsible governments and of the public opinion comes to help. Uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, most wonderful things that has happened uh, is the is the increase of support to Ukraine's EU membership. Uh, among our populations, uh, um, I'm speaking now of the of the citizens of the EU member states, uh, and that gives me that gives me hope that that um, population, the voters, will not let the the politicians to forget to forget Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is it is the responsibility of the governments um, who see clearly that the, the war in Ukraine affects all Europe and in fact affects the whole world. So it needs to be kept high.
high on the agenda, including high on the domestic political agenda, in order to make sure that Ukraine wins this war, and this will not the Russian aggression will not spread out uh, further. Thank you, Ambassador. I also want to ask, uh, what are you working on right now? The what is yes. Yes, apologies. Uh, what is your main point of focus? That's what I wanted to add. Thank you. Uh, first of all, everything Ukraine's EU membership application related was that that enjoys such popularity and also such pertinence on on the on the domestic domestic political agenda in Ukraine. It's um, the Ukrainian leadership is not kidding when they say or not paying any lip service when they say that the international support should materialize in three things. Weapons deliveries, sanctions against the aggressor, and the EU membership perspective. So that's, <clears throat> that's on the agenda everywhere I go with, any, with anybody I meet, that's always on the agenda. Secondly, uh, the EU's assistance that I mentioned. Um, there are there are awful lot of details that that needs to that need that need to need to go right. There are things that we expect the Ukrainian counterparts to do. Um, the EU normally does not just transfer money. There there are there are some conditions. There are there are things that that the that the counterpart must do, uh, and, uh, and if not if not any sort of political conditions, then at least the plans how to spend the money, how to distribute the money within within Ukraine. Uh, very big issue is the future reconstruction, where where the European Commission earlier this week came out with the blueprint. Uh, with the first plan, uh, it's it's for the member states now to discuss in Brussels. And at the same time, uh, any future construction arrangement must enjoy Ukrainian support and must have a Ukrainian Ukrainian participation in managing this. Uh, there has to be there has to be the ownership. So. Um, these are the issues. Uh, this this is one of the huge area uh, we're dealing with humanitarian assistance. Um, uh, unfortunately, is still remains to be high on our agenda. And in addition to immediate needs like like water, uh, medicaments, uh, etc., there are there are all. Already, we have started to see what about the what about the uh, temporary housing. Uh, what are the needs by regions? Because because um, mm, twice as many as as there are refugees uh, in the EU, Ukrainian refugees. Twice as many people have uh, have are internally displaced. They live they live in the western regions of Ukraine. And they have they have huge they have huge needs, um, and then the whole issue of Ukrainian grain export um, is also very high on the agenda. Ukraine is the world's fourth largest wheat exporter, and four hundred million people in the world rely on grain and grain products uh, from Ukraine. Now the the export is effectively blocked by Russia because the, uh, the the Black Sea ports are blocked so so we need to work on how to how to export that grain um, I wanted to ask how much time do we have for this list because the, the list is pretty is pretty long well, I, I can imagine how, how long this list is. Uh, probably it doesn't have an end, really. Um, but I think you actually partially uh, answered one of the other questions that I would uh, like to ask you, but I'm still going to ask it. Uh, if uh, you are in a position to, to think ahead at all, uh, given how turbulent times um, 
we live in right now. Um, what do you think, uh, what would you hope would be your point of focus in your work uh, a few months ahead? Let's maybe also imagine that it's, uh, it's May 2023 and you're going to the Eurovision um, in Kiev or somewhere else in Ukraine. Um, what are you coming um, from? What, what would you be working on then? What's your hope? I'm, I don't know yet. There may even be possibilities for the EU uh, to support the uh, Eurovision Song, Con uh, Song Contest organization. Uh, no, but um, but seriously, seriously, a year, even two months uh, right now are far too long periods for for planning. Mm, a war is ongoing. The war is in a dynamic phase. So uh, anything is hard to predict, um, or, or almost almost anything is hard to predict. Uh, work on the internally displaced people and refugees will will continue. Um, that's for sure. Um, since you asked about two months, then definitely the harvest of this year and the export of Ukrainian grain will remain on the on the agenda for sure. Thank you. I'd like to turn to, to our audience for questions. If you have questions, please raise your virtual hand. Um, before before we give the floor to the audience, I want to ask uh, one other question, and, and in the meantime, we can we can gather some some virtual hands raised. Um, Ambassador, uh, I wouldn't be head of Stratcom Task Force if I didn't ask this question. Uh, so we're having uh, our conversation on a on a very specific day. Uh, in Ukraine, it's Europe Day. We also celebrate, celebrated Europe Day uh, recently in Brussels and all over the EU. And we also just celebrated a few days ago International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, Transphobia. So May is usually a period uh, for the EU to celebrate its values, its principles uh, and being together. But at the same time, we're up against the hideous war propaganda, disinformation and, and lies about Ukraine, about the EU, about the current war and basically everything we stand for. And uh, from your point of view, I would like to ask from, from the ground also, how big is the role um, of disinformation in, in Russia's current aggression against Ukraine? Mm, of course, uh, of course it is. Of course it is. Um, they, uh, I think it's fair to say that the Russians um, um, quite quickly understood that their propaganda towards Ukraine and Ukrainians um, is not very fruitful to put it to put it diplomatically uh, but all the more is the Russian uh, propaganda and fake news targeting uh, the Western audience everything war crime related I mean we all saw we all saw in what state was the was the city of Bucha in late March when the when the Ukrainians kicked the Russians out from there? Um, dead bodies of civilians were lying everywhere, and then the Russians claimed that it was the Ukrainians' work. Um, I would also point out that the that the Russian propaganda seems to be still pretty successful in the in countries farther away in Africa in Asia where they uh, <clears throat> they are trying to they are trying to portray the the of Ukrainian and for that matter uh, also Russian grain export as something that is the West's fault uh, as as if that as if that were the the EU and the US and UK sanctions against Russia that had halted this export. Um, but it's also at the, at the same time, it's fair to say that in Ukraine <clears throat> and in the and in the in the EU, North Africa, uh, sorry, in the EU, North America, uh, Ukraine quickly won the information war. And. Uh, and um, uh, one of the one of the experts in in this business told me, and I don't have any grounds to doubt that that the information war was won when the images of the Ukrainian tractors pulling the Russian abandoned tanks started to started to emerge. That's something that's really an image, very very powerful. 
I couldn't agree more, Ambassador. And uh, um, I think Ukrainian Stratcom is doing a fantastic job and the whole world is watching and getting inspiration from it. But I also do agree that Russia, especially when it's able to cover its tracks, uh, is still very, very active in other parts of the world um, fighting the disinformation war. Um, dear listeners, uh, if there's a question from you, we would gladly give you the floor. Prodi, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, my question was, um, how do you see the future of Ukraine's accession to Ukraine and how fast can it go? I mean, accession to the EU, of course, and how fast do you think it can go? Uh, thank you. It is a question that is uh, on all Ukrainians' uh, mind at, at the moment. There is nobody who can give you any concrete time frame because in order to accede uh, to the European Union, you need to fulfill all the criteria. And, and there are awful lot of criteria, requirements, legislation that any acceding country must adopt uh, to take over EU standards, <clears throat> uh, the, the highest and the most expensive to fulfill in the world, um, take, for example, the environmental standards uh, for for EU for EU products, uh, etc. Um, and there is no there is no shortcut possible there. There is no there is no quick accession possible for the for the simple fact that at the basis of EU's functioning is still the single market. And the single market cannot really function if, if uh, in one part of it, not all the standards and regulations are being, are being uh, followed. Now, um, at the same time, having said this, everything now related with the, to, the, to Ukraine's membership application has, has been dealt with at, at an extraordinary speed. The, the same process that now will take us two months since, since handing over the questionnaire until the Commission's opinion on Ukrainian's application. Uh, the same process took, in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina a couple of years ago, it took two years. So it really is seen as an urgent one. And, and both sides, the EU and Ukraine, are working at very high speed. Thank you, Ambassador. We also have a question from Jane. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, if I tell you I'm from Northern Ireland, I think you might know what my question will be, or possibly a solution. Um, not a solution, obviously. Uh, you, you know that we are in the throes of angry reaction to what has uh, been applied here in Northern Ireland is the protocol, the Northern Ireland protocol. But I, my question to you is, there, is there a, a sort of a type of half in half out situation that can be given in, a, in, an, urgent situ in an urgent position, allowing Ukraine uh, special circumstances in the way that has been done by the EU for Northern Ireland? Is there something to be done there? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, please be assured that um, having having been the Brexit coordinator for the Estonian government in my previous job, I pretty much understand what you what you what you are talking about. Uh, there are there are several things, uh, several um, options that that could theoretically be applied. Um, and and the, it's no secret for you that the U.S. membership application has re-energized also uh, the discussions on some on some privileged partnership uh, European 
political community type of thinking, uh, something that um, 20 years ago uh, European Commission's President Romano Prodi called um, have all the cooperation uh, with the exception of participating in EU institutions. Uh, this all is theoretically possible. What is practically possible uh, is, uh, for instance, uh, since, since um, um, your situation is very much about trade, um, the European Commission recently proposed, and I expect this to be adopted uh, very soon, uh, a proposal to scrap for one year all uh, all tariffs and quotas for Ukraine's uh, uh, export to the EU. That's unprecedented, especially given what kind of production mostly Ukraine exports, that's uh, agricultural um, agricultural production. So yes, there are things that that can um, that can be done and was the will there's the way, um, so flexibility can be found in several areas. This all does not, however, replace the membership process itself. And that's very important to underline because the Ukrainians, Ukrainians want to become also politically European. Ukraine is a, is a European country by history, geography, culture, economically more and more. Now Ukraine wants to become European also in political terms, uh, and and that needs to be respected. Another element here is that that nothing bar the full membership perspective, and that's a that's a universal experience from Central and Eastern Europe. Um, nothing bar the, the full membership perspective gives sufficient motivation for political reforms that all candidate countries badly need. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, dear listeners, if there are other questions, uh, please do raise your virtual hands. Uh, in the meantime, Ambassador, I also want to uh, zoom out perhaps a little bit and, and also ask you for your experience as a diplomat. Um, the whole world is online these days, and uh, obviously foreign policy is affected by that as well. And you, you are one of the very skillful communicators, and you're, you've been using cyber diplomacy tools very effectively. And I want to ask you, from your perspective, also from, uh, from a long perspective of being in the foreign service, be it in your country or in the EU, uh, I'm wondering if uh, if you have any questions about how being uh, online all the time and uh, uh, how the need to communicate uh, all the time about each and every step in, in our policies. How does it um, influence your work? How does it influence diplomacy as such? First of all, and thanks for your kind words, uh, first of all, nothing replaces uh, a physical meeting between human beings. And that's one. Uh, a second point is that... Um, in diplomacy, nothing replaces a physical meeting uh, between human beings that are not hold uh, cameras on. That is um, that holds true as it did one hundred years ago. Um, big international issues can still only be decided uh, at confidential uh, physical uh, physical meetings. At the same time, of course, um, of course, um, Twitter and social media have, have equipped us with much better and quicker means to communicate what we are doing, our, um, our action, but also our position. Uh, I was very skeptical um, when, when sort of Twitter came into being, or when, to be more precise, when when all 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 foreign policy guys and journalists moved to Twitter, I was skeptical. I mean, uh, new and a nuanced foreign policy position can hardly be expressed in one hundred and forty characters. Uh, Two hundred and eighty is better already. I admit, and that's 
and that's that's helpful. Uh, quite often, um, I see in my work um, uh, a tweet uh, replaces a letter. Uh, uh, what what normally would have been would have been communicated by a by a letter to your colleague uh, is now communicated by a, by a tweet. Um, visible for everybody else and nothing and nothing wrong with that but there there are there are strong nuances in in um, in communicating that way which you can clearly clearly see and which I can see also from my daily practice um, a serious foreign policy position tweet gets much, much less um, attraction than than an emotional tweet of um, of um, say beautiful Ukrainian landscape. I mean, no, I mean peace times, um, or or a, an an emotional emotional tweet, emotional image, um, including including. Um, you know, symbols, including images of kids, um, things, things like that. So it's um, um, it's an additional tool, but it by far cannot uh, cannot this replace diplomacy proper. Thank you for that insight, Ambassador. Um, I also want to ask, and zooming in back to to Ukraine and to the. Um, very difficult situation that we are witnessing. Um, I want to uh, ask you about war crimes, Ambassador. Um, we are witnessing them, obviously, and you are seeing them from the ground as well. Um, Russia's war crimes against Ukraine. Um, could you elaborate on how, uh, what role can the EU play in documenting them and helping uh, Ukraine bring the perpetrators to justice? There's lots of cooperation already ongoing with the Ukrainian authorities, and you you hinted uh, quite rightly that at this stage <coughs> sorry at this stage what's the most important is to document and uh, a a photo will not do a photo is not enough it needs to be carefully forensically uh, documented um, and, and then uh, be prepared to uh, for all the charges uh, pressing charges and the cases uh, raising cases in in both Ukrainian and international courts, and you know that these things um, internationally are very tricky. Um, issues of jurisdiction, um, issues of of um, people just not showing up, um, and of course, um, it unfortunately is so that the that bad people. Uh, can quite often hire the best lawyers. Um, so, so a very good, also analytical work and preparation is needed. On at the EU side, there's a, a strong coordination by Commissioner Reinders and his services, the Eurojust, uh, and others. The EU advisory mission um, for civilian security um is working on the ground started restarted it it's working it's work in kiev um in fact in fact today and there is also cooperation with our uh, with our us and uk and other partners but that will be something that will employ us so to say for for years to come and i would guess this will be one of the essential uh, points uh, with which we can help ukraine as well um, thank you ambassador we have a question from alice please go ahead alice yeah good uh, good afternoon this is alice Stolmeyer from defend democracy um i would like to expand a little bit on what the ambassador was just saying on uh, russian crimes uh, because i read that uh, president Zelensky has yesterday called for international partners to ensure that uh, Russia compensates also financially uh, what they have destroyed in Ukraine. Uh, he urges the partners to recognize that they must be held financially responsible for the crimes they committed and for everything they have destroyed. Um, 
for example, he calls to freeze and seize assets. Do you think that is um, uh, that is feasible? And perhaps, uh, and if so, should we perhaps even broaden the scope, not just to what has been destroyed in Ukraine, but also, uh, for example, if there is indeed um, uh, a food crisis, uh, whether we should also hold Russia financially uh, um, responsible for the all the humanitarian aid that we, we will need to uh, send. Thank you. Indeed, um, President Zelensky has a strong point here. Uh, also, when he <clears throat> when he points out very rightly that uh, that uh, Russia's GDP is expected to fall by around ten percent this year, whereas Ukraine's GDP is expected to fall at least forty percent. So that's definitely an imbalance that ideally should be compensated. Uh, the idea. Uh, the idea of making Russia pay, making the aggressor pay, is a very right one. Um, I will, I will at this stage only focus on the on the um, issues or, or possibilities that we have now. I will leave out a possible future peace agreement that would that would entail reparations or compensations. Um, <clears throat> it is it. You know very well that. There's a wide discussion uh, right now going on in all the countries and entities that have imposed sanctions in the EU, in the US, in the UK. I mean, freezing assets is is something is is something easy and easy, um, relatively easy to do and easy to grasp. Seizing them, confiscating them, as far as the EU is concerned, uh, it's a matter for national competence. And national uh, member states, national jurisdiction. I hear, I may be mistaken. I hear that that in this case it is legally possible, and it um, it could be done. And again, I mean, humanely, morally speaking, it's it's only right. Uh, I'm not fully aware of the of the legislative situation in all EU member states. Then there's a, <clears throat> a bit broader question about the assets of the Russian central bank that have been frozen, uh, if I'm not mistaken, $300 billion uh, worth. And there already, uh, although the US law, if I got this correctly, um, should, at certain circumstances, provide for a possibility to, to seize that. That also raises raises uh, a bit more wider issue of the of the rules mm -hmm. applying internationally uh, and the certainty one still wants to have in operating in a in a rules based world. So so to sum up, your your question is a very pertinent one. Morally, you mainly uh, there is there can cannot be any question. Uh, and I can only hope that the, that the discussions and deliberations um, in the EU's case in, in member states, in EU member states, can uh, can be finalized quickly. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, if there are no other questions, I'm, I'm giving you, dear audience, uh, a chance to still come forward. But we don't see any other questions for now. If not the case, then I suggest we, we let uh, the ambassador um, go about his busy day. Um, thank you very much for, for being with us, ambassador. I do hope we can meet again here and, and hopefully soon and hopefully with some, with some good news. Um, if I may uh, quote your article uh, for the Leonard Mary conference that, that you wrote uh, quite recently, uh, you mentioned there that sometimes the EU... Um, when asked by someone to be our ally, uh, the use response, uh, immediate response uh, or a reflex is not, not always, yes, we need friends, be our friend, but rather what is the legal basis for our friendship? And I think the case of Ukraine shows that this is not always the case, luckily for Ukraine and for us as well. Um, 
and that um, there is a path uh, before Ukraine and we are helping Ukraine as, as much as we can in all possible dimensions. Ambassador, if there's anything you would like to share uh, as your final words, please go ahead. I wanted, uh, thanks, Martina. I wanted to thank uh, all the uh, all those who, who participated, especially, of course, those who, who asked uh, questions. Uh, and and uh, to your last point, indeed, for me personally, the way how the EU responds to Ukraine's membership application, so that's something that three months ago nobody was even even ready to start discussing. Uh, ex extending the membership perspective to the countries beyond the Western Balkans regions, a region in Turkey that already have this. Uh, that was was completely, dis any, any discussion was completely missing. Now we are discussing that and, and the way how we respond determines for me personally of whether, whether we are really up to being a geopolitical unit entity or not. Thank you very much from beautiful Kiev um, and wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you, dear audience, and uh, also thank you very much for our delegation in Kiev for help and uh, for the EAS team uh, for all the organizational effort. Uh, thank you and see you soon. Bye-bye. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, dear audience, uh, welcome to this Twitter space that is celebrating Workers' Freedom Day by talking to Ukrainian journalists and media experts straight uh, from Ukraine. Um, I'm Martina Bilzukiewicz, I'm head of East Stratcom Task Force at the European External Action Service and with us uh, we have three guests. Uh, Roxolana Lisowska is head of the International News Department of Public Broadcasting Company of Ukraine. Iria Ponomarenko is a journalist and war reporter at the Kiev Independent. And uh, Oksana Romaniu is executive director of the Institute of Mass Information, a non-governmental organization working on improving the media environment in Ukraine. Uh, before we uh, dig in, um, Oksana, if I can kindly ask you to accept the request to become speaker, um, because we need to activate your mic. And uh, let's uh, start the discussion. Um, I think we are uh, all uh, on the same page when it comes to appreciating how important it is uh, to have independent media and access to independent information, especially at the times of war, uh, which Ukraine is, is fighting right now for all of us. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the war um, creates an increased demand for credible information. But on the other hand, it brings not only uh, additional pressure to those that uh, work on delivering this information, but also brings direct threats to the safety of journalists, to uh, the business models of media, and creates enormous difficulties even to sustain the media operation. We are very honored that all of our three guests uh, are with us uh, today. And uh, I would suggest that we start by Roxolana. Hello, Roxolana. Very, very nice to have you with us. Um, and I would like to ask a question to all three of you. Um, how has the 24th of February and the days that followed changed the way you work? So, uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Roxolana and the February 24th was the worst day of our life. Uh, on February 24th, the UIPBC began broadcasting news around the clock, uh, later reunited with five other Ukrainian TV channels into a single marathon. Uh, we are now working on a united front, and the great advantage of uh, UIPBC is that we have the largest correspondent network in Ukraine, and we can uh, quickly know what happened in each region uh, of Ukraine. For example, in, uh, uh, in Kharkiv, we have a correspondent, our correspondent Slava Mavrichev, and this is a correspondent who is always ready to go to hotspots, he can shoot materials and make live broadcasts, uh, so we know everything about shelling in Kharkiv. 
Uh, now we, we we don't include speakers who have uh, pro-Russian or neutral rhetoric into our broadcast. In fact, we, we haven't done it before, but now it's been checked very, very carefully uh, because Russia is our enemy and uh, pro-Russian rhetoric, it's, it's very bad. Uh, we also show uh, the, state, the statements uh, of our authorities. It's no matter how or what we think about uh, our president before the war, but now he is our commander in chief. So we must work together. We must believe him, and we must believe that he uh, tried to do uh, all uh, for our victory. But we, of course, we will return to criticism after the week. But we should be like a united front, uh, front line. And now, in a single marathon, we have uh, five hours uh, of air time every day. Uh, every hour, we give a blog of news first, and then we, we have, like, um, talkings. We communicate with correspondents from regions, with, local re uh, with, with locals or uh, opinion leaders. Uh, our working day now is uh, 12 hours. Uh, seven hours of preparation for the broadcast and five hours of the broadcast in itself. Uh, after that, we have five hours on duty, but I, I don't think that is our like main room time. So 12 hours, it's our everyday, like, everyday working day. Uh, since the beginning of our war, uh, our work has changed a lot. It's true. Uh, for example, I was an editor and uh, mostly did um, managerial work giving assignments to my colleagues from the international news department department but now i'm an editor editor a journalist like ukrainian news journalist i'm an international news journalist i'm a presenter and a translator and sometimes i, I interview some people and also i work with the international broadcasting union i sent videos from ukraine to the european countries because it's very nice to show uh, what now uh, in Ukraine? So it's also my work now. Mm, I think that's it's like a sh short uh, explanation of my work. Thank you very much, Roxolana. We will uh, get into details of your work and, and uh, many obstacles and hardships that you need to deal with. But before we do that, I, I want to ask the same question to Ilya. Uh, Ilya, has, how has your life and your work changed after Russia invaded Ukraine again? Um. Yes, it has changed a lot um, in terms of the intensity and uh, the stressfulness of this work as well. It could be compared to to the situation when you do push-ups on a regular basis. But now, after the uh, the big Russian invasion, you have to do basically the same thing, but with someone sitting on your shoulder. <laughs> so, so, yeah, our careers, our duty as journalists, it has enter the new stage it's even more it's like it's like 10 times more stressful 10 times more intense 10 times more uh more required and diligence and um very very emotional stability i would say so yes it's a, it's a very complicated thing but i would suggest us thinking that you know the ukrainian journalism also the western media they are doing a very good job in terms of you know letting the world know what's happening in there. I would say that I'm feeling proud about, you know, the Ukrainian journalism and, and also with our Western colleagues, because in many ways, what Ukraine has now in terms of, um, you know, public support uh, and public opinion in Western countries, totally supporting Ukraine and rendering pressure on their governments in terms of, you know, providing weapons and uh, financial. And it's, it's a huge factor that helps Ukraine win this war and prevail. So in many ways, we journalists and all our Western colleagues, we have made our contribution not to only you know, serve our duty, but also help and actually defend this country because because public, public opinion sees the news, what happened to Bucha and other places. So we are doing a good job, I, I believe, I mean, the, the whole community of journalists, and I'm really feeling proud about it. Thank you very much, Ilya, for those uh, first remarks. I would like to go to Oksana now, but I can see we have uh, uh, some, some technical challenges. So um, let me maybe 
again to the next question that I would have also building, building on what you said already um, so it's one thing to, to do those push-ups with somebody actually sitting on your shoulder but also um, you also mentioned this Ilya um, there is an emotional um, hardship and challenge to all this given that your own country was attacked and also given that uh, you deal with extremely extremely polluted information space and also given that Russia also recognizes how much uh, this war is taking place also in the information environment. Um, just to name a few examples, Russian occupiers have shot 11 TV towers in eight regions of Ukraine. Um, the Ukrainian broadcasting is disrupted. Um, also, the um, Russia have seized Ukrainian media offices in, in some regions. They are switching the broadcasting to Russian channels. Uh, DDoS attacks are being conducted. Um, Kherson region is completely cut off from the internet. These are just a few examples that I think uh, show again how much more difficult it is uh, to do your work, um, but also how much uh, the information front, if I may call it that, of the war um, is uh, how, how uh, important role it is playing. Um, so given all this, the emotional um, side uh, of this, the polluted information space and the importance of the information space in this war. Um, how do you keep your objective and professional standards? That's what I would like to ask you. How, um, how do you uh, actually deal with all this and how do you make uh, your work still so relevant and important? Maybe we can start with Ilya for a change. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a big challenge to us all. Uh, and uh, you correctly mentioned the fact that it's very hard to be uh, a truthful, um, a careful journalist in the time when, for instance, my own hometown, which is Vonovar, has been just raised to the ground. Same with Mariupol, which was also a very important city in my life. Same as Bucha. Um, so it is very hard to stay emotionally stable and not to start writing, you know, silly things on Twitter, including a lot of F words about what's happening. And also to double check all the things that you are posting. Because sometimes, you know, you as, as a journalist, you stay... Uh, stay a human being with your own emotions. For instance, if you see something, something that gives you a lot of hope and positive emotions about some victory by the Ukrainian forces, for instance, you know, Ukrainian military have downed, for instance, downed a jet, um, a Russian jet somewhere in Kharkiv, and you see uh, probably a picture, a video, and you want to post it immediately just because you know, it gives you. It gives you good feeling about this. It, you just naturally want to share this beautiful, this great news about your country, about your military, about this. But sometimes you end up posting something that was not relevant, that was not 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 happening in this war. So, and you just uh, flipped of this necessity to double check. So, I have been, I have seen a couple of things like that uh, from, in my work. So, with the time, with all these weeks, I just uh, forced myself into. Um, double thinking and th thinking twice and maybe three times, four times over what I am posting, what I'm tweeting and double checking every single bit of information because in this environment, everybody is prone to this issue uh, with posting irrelevant stuff because it feels it feels great to be posting this. So I just made, made a rule for myself. The louder it sounds, the more attention and carefulness it, it requires. So I'm trying to be truthful and... Um, and honest uh, in front of my audience, uh, in front of the people that trust my opinion. I'm trying to let, not let them down. But the most basic rules I would say is to go triple checking on every single word you say, because it's very complicated. Yeah. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, I can see that Oksana is, oh no, we lost Oksana again, I'm afraid. Um, Roxolana, what's, what's your take on uh, all of this that was, was mentioned already? Yeah, uh, it had talked about uh, the uh, unverified information, and it's really true because it's a big problem. We know many sources in social networks with many, many information, and it's very important to check it from uh, from uh, official sources. 
uh, or something like that. Uh, and uh, I can tell you about one example when there uh, were when on the internet was a video uh, from explosion at Az Az Azostal in Mariupol, but later it turned out that th this was old video. It was from a com completely different city, and it, it was a warehouse where ammunition were uh, was detonated. So it's we, we must check information for some times, and it's really uh, one of the challenges. But uh, for me. Mm, um, the most challenged, I, I think it's psychological thing because I have uh, relatives who are from the armed forces of Ukraine and my husband, he is a policeman and my many of my friends are military. And uh, the most difficult for me to, is to think about them and work at the same time. And it's very difficult to find out that your friend was killed on the battlefield. And you can cry a little and then continue to do a joke. And a week later, again, you find out that another of your friend w was died. And it's really difficult. But uh, you should stay strong because you are a journalist. And... Um, you have many challenges. Uh, another challenge is uh, the ability to strike a balance between panicking and overcoming the audience. It is impossible, it is not true and it's a bad idea to talk only about the things that can lead people to uh, um, bad feelings like despair or something like that. And, but it's also, we can't talk only about the victories because then when we have uh, some information about like occupation, it's uh, much more difficult to understand for audience why if we talk only about our victories. And also we know exact number of uh, our dead soldiers. Uh, this is a question when it will be possible to name this this uh, figures. The Ukrainians understand that this is a huge number of deaths, but psychologically it is easier to know these numbers. Uh, and I talked to the military and they said that it is the right decision not to tell the loss uh, of our troops, but it's only a matter of time. And um, also about um, uh, about uh, more challenge, it's uh, how to show dead bodies because uh, now uh, all our news it's about death or most of our news and uh, yes we show bodies this death and mass graves but uh, we blur faces uh, now ukrainians are used to seeing these horrible pictures of death but we have respect for the dead and their relatives so we don't show uh, faces of dead people Thank you very much, Oksana, for those insights. Uh, I will now try um, Oksana again. Oksana, can you can you speak? Can you unmute your mic? I'm afraid not. Uh, let's let's keep trying then, and let's uh, move on. Um, what I would also okay, I can see Oksana is a speaker now. Oksana, if you if you can, okay, you can hear me, and thank you for the very interesting discussion because I believe that journalists I'm afraid we lost the connection again let's let's keep trying we'll go back to Oksana uh, I hope uh, in a few minutes um, Oksana's uh, the institution that Oksana is representing Institute of Mass Information has produced um, among other interesting reports a report about war crimes against journalists and this is what I would like to uh, ask Oksana about among other things uh, Oksana I can see your back perhaps let's try again no um, let's then move to to, to um, the topic of uh, war crimes, which I think is one of the crucial ones uh, given the current situation. So what I would like to ask you, Roxolana and Ilya, um, is uh, how do you see your role and the journalist's role in general in documenting war crimes uh, that are being committed every day right now? And uh, uh, how do you see your role in hopefully ultimately bringing perpetrators uh, to account? Uh, let's maybe start with Roxolana now. My college colleagues who work in field, they do extremely important work. Our documentaries are now traveling through the uh, liberated territories and they filming the uh, what happened, they filming uh, the results of uh, the shelling and also they interviewing people. Uh, it's a huge help 
to our like, police and uh, it's uh, additional evidence for the Hawk tribu Tribunal. Uh, as for me, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, I'm an international journalist, so uh, I don't do this uh, huge and important, uh, honestly, yes, of course, I don't uh, do this uh, ex extremely important important job, but uh, my colleagues who are uh, on Bucha or in Irpin, they are my heroes who make this, this job. Ilya, your comments on the matter? Yes, yeah, sure. You know, when we came to Bucha almost immediately after it was liberated, we have seen all those things that we were hearing rumors about, like uh, FSB, Russian FSB officers coming to every single corner and uh, looking for men and uh, checking documents. We have heard rumors uh, before Bucha was liberated that Russians, uh, they hunt for men uh, and the uh, they inflict uh, shooting sprees in town, but those were rumors. And the first thing that I saw in Bucha, uh, after I, the first thought that I had after I came to Bucha was that we need to, to document every single corner what was happening in there so, to let the world know uh, in terms of the war crimes that were happening, in terms of the brutalities, and in general, the very brutal attitude towards you know, usual people in Bucha, there in Bucha, because from the Russian soldiers, because so lots of people in Bucha, they have uh, literally spent months, including lots of males, young males, they spent months hiding in a basement just because they wanted to avoid uh, being being seen by Russian by the Russian military, because nobody could predict what what's going to happen next after you uh, get caught by the Russian military. So the chances are high that that you'll be killed. Or something like that. Obviously, the role of journalists in this regard, I, I, I would say that what happened to Bucha, for instance, uh, and the uh, journalists' work in Bucha, the way it was exposed, the way it was carefully and uh, doubtfully documented, because we have seen satellite pictures, we have stream view, uh, street views videos, uh, we have pretty much any, any possible piece of evidence that could be uh, available, could be obtained to uh, absolutely, totally prove the uh, Russian guilt in war crimes. So yes, I think the Bucha massacre, the uh, in general, the case of uh, Russian war in Ukraine, it, it was like, a, it, it is now a textbook example, a textbook example of uh, how important true and free and uh, all accessible journalism is really, especially in terms of conflict. Just imagine what we could have if we did not have any journalists here in, here in Ukraine, if the Western media uh, were neglectful towards Ukraine or uh, the country was closed uh, from, um, from the world media. Uh, many things that have happened in, in this country, in Kiev and other cities could be concealed from the public attention, from the world attention. So it's a textbook example of what's happening here in, here in, in journalism. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ilya. Um, I also obviously agree uh, that your role is absolutely, absolutely essential in bringing perpetrators to justice and to document um, the war crimes. Uh, but speaking of war crimes, it's not only uh, about you documenting them, you being the witnesses uh, and essential in um, uh, recording uh, the examples uh, of uh, horrible, horrible atrocities. It's also about war crimes being directed against uh, journalists, your colleagues, yourselves. Um, according to the um, Institute of Mass Information, there were 243 war crimes committed by Russia against media and journalists uh, in Ukraine. Um, this is something that uh, I hope we will still be able to discuss with Oksana if, if she manages to connect um, in detail. But um, before that happens, I, I want to kind of go back to the question of how do you deal with that, given that uh, you operate under uh, heavily, um, under very uh, difficult, to say the least, circumstances uh, with death threats, with uh, um, incidents uh, targeting journalists uh, happening every day. Um, so maybe a bit more of a personal question, if you don't mind. How do you actually deal with that? And I can see Oksana here again, so let's try with Oksana first. The connection broke off again. Um, Roxolana, if I may uh, ask you to, to, to um, comment on that question I just asked. Mm -hmm. 
he, if you talk about uh, our psychological stability, um, for example, uh, in UAPBC, they have a psychologist uh, who can be contacted if it's necessary. But I decided for myself that I would seek psychological support uh, after the victory because now we will learn about many deaths and action and I understand that it will continue. So um, I think that... Now I'm not ready to go to psychologist. I'll do it, of course. Uh, for me, sometimes it helps uh, to cry because uh, first uh, weeks I was like a robot who just w woke up and worked. Uh, I noticed I had wrinkles on my face and that my uh, hair become gray. But I can't cry. I don't know why, but I can't do it. And about two weeks later, I was able to cry. And then it got a little easier. Uh, where, uh, I think that also when you have your day off, it's better to put off the phone for at least a few hours and not read the news. Uh, if possible, go in for sport or walk in the park or drink your favorite tea or coffee because you can became, become mad of this uh, huge, massive, uh, bad information, everyday information. And uh, also communication with children helps me. I visited uh, the wounded children in hospitals several times and we played various games with them and it's really um, then you understand that life is still here and we have our people near near us and they are still alive and it's good sometimes you try to find something good in in this life Thank you so much, Roxolana, for sharing those uh, also personal, very personal insights uh, with us. Um, Ilya, what would be your take? Uh, speaking of potential or actual war crimes against journalists here in Ukraine, uh, the war uh, in Ukraine, uh, to be honest, I did not expect this war to be so brutal in terms of uh, the general degree of hostilities. And uh, I did not expect it to be so such a heavy toll on, on journalists. I, th I think we have had 20 killed journalists, Western and Ukrainian, through the first weeks of the war, uh, specifically when it comes to the Battle of Kiev. So yeah, it was a, it was a bad surprise, a surprisingly high death toll among journalists. So obviously this war is pretty dangerous to journalists, especially when it comes to like open hostilities. Uh, so yeah. Obviously, in many cases that we have seen in Kiev, uh, for instance, the death of, uh, of an American journalist who was shot dead um, uh, in the European Bridge in the early weeks of the Battle of Kiev, obviously, it has, trace, it has some traces of Russian, potential Russian war crimes against, against journalists. So when it comes to how to deal with the uh, Russian um, brutality against journalists, uh, let's not forget about the fact that some journalists have been kidnapped by Russians in occupied territory. So yes, it's a it's a brutal place for journalists, obviously. Uh, speaking of uh, how to deal with these things, I have several I don't know rules that help me somehow. First thing is that uh, I never left Kiev except for a very brief moment when I had to take my my mom to West Ukraine. So I stayed in Kiev and uh, with with the military and uh, with other agencies, power agencies here in Ukraine for the whole duration of the Battle of Kiev. And I'm staying here right now. So what helped me as I got deployed to battlefields, uh, east or west, uh, it, it's a sort of my experience before the war. So you know, uh, you know the war, you know how it's happened, you understand the battlefields, you have the skill of listening to what the military say to, uh, the skill of um, um, looking at what they are doing, of listening to what they say. So it gives you a good amount of safety in terms of your um, deployment to the to the, uh, the battlefield. And same goes about you know your personal security uh, in terms of your whereabouts. Um, I made no secret of the fact that uh, during the Battle of Kiev, I lived just next to European, so I I was living in a house just maybe several hundreds of meters of the actual battlefield. So I was pretty exposed to the uh, potential gunfire and uh, shells or artillery shells, but so. I tried not to um, not to reveal my whereabouts in terms of the uh, neighborhood I live in Kiev. I stay in Kiev, so a bit of a reasonable security for yourself, just be just because it, it is necessary. But in general, I would say that um, 
I'm not, I'm not uh, when it comes to myself, I'm not prone to uh, being overly overly busy in terms of, you know, se- uh, ensuring my own personal security as a journalist. You know, in wartime, as a war journalist, I consider this as the as an acceptable risk because this is your job. This is what we do. Uh, if I worked as a fireman, of course, there's there should be something to take you for granted because uh, as a fireman, for instance, you... You have to face the risk of uh, uh, of getting turned twice during the fire because this is part of your job. This should be expected. Same about journalism in in wartime. You just can't be one hundred percent safe, but there are lots of things that you can reasonably do to stay safe personally and to ensure the safety uh, or ensure the acceptable amount of uh, acceptable degree of safety for your colleagues and also for the military in front of you because we all know the. Facts uh, on all the histories of journalists sharing pictures, inappropriate pictures, and that eventually led to uh, uh, to shelling, to attacks against the military because they disclosed their their whereabouts in the battlefield. So there are basic rules, and the I guess the most basic rules is just stay reasonable, stay, keep your head cool, and stay professional, and you'll be fine. Thank you very much, Ilya, and thank you, Roxolana, as well. Uh, it sounds so easy when you say it, just keep your head cool, just do your job. But uh, we know that uh, it really takes a lot of courage and integrity to, to do your job right now. Um, dear audience, we will um, have uh, space for you uh, to, to ask questions uh, very soon. So please raise your hand if... Uh, if you want to ask a question. Um, before we do that, I would like to ask another question uh, to, to, to um, our guests, and this will be about disinformation. Um, from uh, our point of view, from you versus disinfo point of view, disinformation plays a huge role in this uh, war as well. And obviously, uh, in your work, you um, both Roxolana and Ilya, you must have been following uh, pro-Kremlin, Russia's propagandist outlets for a long time. Uh, so I would like to ask for your assessment. How um, big um, is the role of Russia's disinformation and war propaganda in the build-up to the war and also in the justification of, of war crimes and of the war Russia is um, continuing? Let's maybe start with Ilya now. Uh, okay. So obviously the role of disinformation and propaganda, war propaganda, is absolutely crucial. It's key. It's the... Uh, essence of this war you know because war starts not not exactly on the battlefield war starts with uh getting your people and your soldiers uh prepared emotionally prepared and justified for what they're doing because obviously any sort of war is a nasty thing so any sort of uh, of military action uh, especially in this scale and, uh, and with this level of brutality it demands certain informational support for this. Of course, what we have seen uh, in Bucha and other places, it's the result of many years of uh, strict dehumanization of the Ukrainians, of the, of the Ukrainian nation. You know, we have we all have seen all these, you know, patterns of uh, uh, of Russian propaganda just ridiculing the fact that Ukraine is, in nas- is, is an independent nation. You know, they are openly laughing about this. They were, you know, um, downsizing the significance of Ukrainians. Uh, the they uh, ridiculed the Ukrainians as as the as you know the people. Lots of silly jokes about it. So obviously that was part of dehumanization and uh, creating this whole narrative that has nothing in common with reality. I mean, people seriously they do seriously believe about you know Ukrainian being Nazis, like real actual Nazis about this. It's not a propaganda construct that you know not not will turn their ears on, but it's a general standard for dehumanizing dehumanizing the enemy and uh, one of the things that we missed uh, in ukraine probably in the west as well is that we have been watching this you know, propaganda hysteria in russia but we never take took it serious enough you know uh, maybe that comes uh, with the fact that you know many in russia did not seriously took it uh, for years it's the general dehumanization politics that and we have seen these results in Bucha because uh, many soldiers, uh, Russian soldiers and officers, but this atrocities because they have been prone to this dehumanization propaganda. So it's a huge thing uh, <clears throat> in war. Basically, it's the without the, this dehumanization of propaganda, this aggressive propaganda, and decline Ukraine as a nation. I think there would be uh, there would be no war because you can't just send soldiers not prepared, not prepared emotionally to kill. Uh, <clears throat> 
to kill and destroy about this, not to uh, not to get them ready to perceive their mission as something something that is acceptable, that, that is fine, because these people are not so they do not deserve to live like this and to live. Uh, they do not deserve anything other than you know being sub- submitted and uh, conquered. So yes, it's it's a huge thing about this thing, and we this is the probably the worst example of dehumanization and the the instigation of hatred since I guess the Rwanda genocide of 1990s. Thank you very much, Ilya. Roxolana, over to you for comments. Uh, what can I add that um, I must admit that the Russian propaganda machine that uh, has worked for years and now uh, has worked very well time, but only for the Russians, not for Ukrainians or our Western friends. And now uh, Russian, Russian, they are used to living in that and very big amount of them haven't critical thinking. For example, RIA News provided news almost always about how bad the West is and what the problems are there, but don't uh, at the same time RIA uh, don't doesn't uh, write about internal problems of Russia, and they have already created a new language, as in Orwell, and uh, where they replace any negative. Uh, for example, the flooding of the station now uh, Russians called the appearance of water, and the crashed plane is a hard landing, and so on. It's many examples of that, and the Russians believe in, in it. Uh, but fortunately, this propaganda works only on Russians, and I hope so. And uh, I think that Russia lost the informational war. Thank you very much, Roxana. Let's hope Russia will indeed lose the uh, the information war. Uh, and about the new language, we also at EU versus Info cover this new uh, uh, speak um, that uh, Russia's disinformation machine is... Um, uh, exercising the special military operation um, being one of the most uh, well, yeah. known examples yeah. of that. Um, dear audience, uh, this would be the time for you to uh, ask questions to our distinguished guests. And I can see an account called Solidarity with Ukraine wanting to take the floor. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. I will try once again to speak. Uh, this is oh, fantastic. Please go ahead, Oksana. Because uh, it seems to me there are some problems maybe with connection. Uh, hi, everybody, and thank you very much for this uh, very interesting discussion. Because uh, indeed, Ukraine today is probably the symbol of the importance of independent media and we show how in practice um, you see independent media are the basis of democracy contrary to propaganda kremlin vertical one voice policy uh, because um, this uh, tyranny this dictatorship they attack media and they shoot into journalists they shoot into tv stations when they enter ukrainian territory um they try to cut off because they do not need pluralism they are afraid of pluralism they are afraid of journalism and um, this is very important now for the whole world to rise in support of journalism in support of safe work of journalists in ukraine and in all other countries and in support of uh free press, free media, as the basis of democracy. So fortunately, I can speak now um, due to a good connection. And um, well, I can share a little bit about my experience. Uh, when the war started, we had to relocate very quickly because our district was heavily shelled. And uh, fortunately, um, we only had like now some problems with windows. Um, there are people who suffered much more um, damage and uh, we still continue our work. We have network in all regions of Ukraine. Uh, before the war, we focused on journalism ethics, on freedom of expression. Uh, we developed legislation our law, our draft law on protection of journalist rights was registered in parliament on February 23, just one day before the war. And on the next day, the war started and all 
the work that we did was just in vain <laughs> in some uh, because we invested a lot of efforts into that legislation. We had to quickly adapt to the situation. We have network in all regions of Ukraine and our network turned into kind of logistic network because we uh, focused on two main priorities. First is safety. Uh, there were almost uh, no protective equipment uh, in Ukraine. We uh, contracted um, and we had bulletproof vests uh, before the war, like uh, with help of internet network, some of them. And uh, well, maybe what they believed that there will be the real war in like on the whole side of Ukraine. So we had to focus very quickly on um, finding these bullet professed helmets, first aid kits, transporting them into Ukrainian territory and uh, here I and, and then sending it to the front lines and to the cities where they will be the most necessary. And the second most important uh, part of our work was to document crimes against media and journalists that were committed by Russia in Ukrainian territory. As of today, we have seven journalists who were killed with cameras in their hands because of their work as journalists. And uh, some, uh, they were identified as press, but they were just shot into, and um, this is a terrible crime. And, well, and uh, another 15 journalists were uh, victims of shelling, shooting. Just last week, last Thursday, our colleague, journalist Vera Hirich of Radio Liberty, she was she was killed by a Russian missile, which uh, hit into the center of Kyiv and it hit directly into her flat. Um, and Vera was found under the debris. I can't believe that I'm talking about that. And just and this is happening in my city, which is a normal European capital developed where we were working over legislation. We were like we had our problems, we discussed, we quarreled, we uh, we had this free speech. Well, so for us, uh, documenting these crimes against media and journalists now is very important. And we have a working group uh, with Prosecutor's General Office of Ukraine. Uh, so we do not only register them for public use, we also uh, proceed with um, this, uh, all this information is turned into real criminal cases. And we also, our plan is to bring these cases to the International Criminal Court in Hague, because, you know, the journalists are non-combatants and uh, like TV towers that were shot by Russia in Ukraine, they were 100% civic objects. And Russia targeted journalists, targeted uh, transmitters, broadcasters, because it doesn't need free media. It doesn't need pluralism of thoughts. Uh, and another important point uh, I want to make here is that propaganda should also be tried in court. It is a criminal, very serious crime because uh, those Russians who come here, they do not treat us as people. They do not believe that Ukrainians are real people. We were dehumanized by Russian propaganda for them. They do not uh, understand uh, for for them we are not uh, living we are not humans so this uh, russian propaganda allowed them to kill uh, ukrainians because ukrainians are not humans seems like uh, this is the very grave crime grave crime that was committed by russian propaganda and if you even uh, and it continues if you turn um, on this uh, propaganda, how to say, um, I can't say that this is a talk show because it is not normal uh, talk show. It's some video uh, with uh, key uh, speakers of Russian propaganda. They continue to dehumanize Ukrainians. They continue supporting Prim this war and they are now like openly calling to kill, to throw a nuclear nuclear bomb, threaten with it. This is not normal. This is a huge crime. 
everybody knows about this Rwanda radio uh, of Thousand Hills that uh, in their air they were calling on to kill uh, people. And we have the same situation now with Russia. It is not enough just to de uh, debunk fakes. These serious um, disinformation crimes, they should be tried also in International Criminal Court in Hague. They should be these aggressors and those who instigated these crimes, they should be punished. And this should, this, this should be stopped and never repeated again, because a lot of people died because of this propaganda. The war actually based on this uh, disinformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oksana, for those very, very important words. And I'm also very glad that, that we managed to overcome the challenge of, of uh, the connection. Um, if I may, I still want to ask at least one question. Um, and maybe we can start with, with Oksana now. Um, the general question that I would have to you is how to talk about the war, how to talk about atrocities, how to talk about all this that you are seeing every day um, to your Western audiences. Um, and uh, if I may also build on that, uh, have you, especially in the first weeks of war, have you experienced any kind of stereotypes, any kind of difficulties in explaining how things uh, are on the ground? Oksana, if, if I can ask you to share your um, impressions, your insights on this. Well, um, thank you for this question. It is, um, it is very hard to report about atrocities and uh, massacres. And we have uh, chats with journalists where we discuss these things and that colleagues are really seriously... Um, they are seriously emotionally hit by this situation. I can talk about the colleagues who were in Kiev Oblast, in Bucha, and they had to um, document and report about the crimes connected with mass killing of people and real atrocities, raping of um, even um, children. And we discussed how to how how it is possible to report about it. We understood that it is important for the world to know, but at the same time, it should be uh, ethical first of all. And um, we uh, finally there was a decision, and um, the report was based on the testimony of psychologists who uh, worked with these people. At the same time, another um, scene uh, was initiated by photographers who worked again in, uh, like, it, it is an example, in Kiev Oblast, and they took photos of what ha was happening there. And they created photo banks, uh, basically it were folders, where um, uh, on, on on the clouds and uh, those folders they were uh, disseminated between photographic and journalistic community for free, because we believed uh, all of us believe that it is um, very important for the world to know what was going on there, how how terrible it was, and you can choose from this photo. Um, I, I can't even uh, imagine how emotionally hard it was for these journalists to work in these cities to um, film every scene and to um, report it. So they even did not uh, uh, raise the issue of like copyright. They just said, you can take these photos and you can show it to to everybody. So we have this internal discussion all the time when we have um, to report about very um, this um, hard situations. And we um, remember, we, we try to be ethical, we try uh, to consult all the time with uh, psychologists, of course, because not to um, press upon victims, not to 
um, expose too much of personal life of those people who were hit by war. We have a lot of challenges connected with that. And um, we are seeking now maybe some uh, advice on how to, where are those red lines where you have to stop before um, going on with your questions too much. Uh, well, so everything is um, complicated, but we uh, work on this all the time. Thank you very much, Oksana. Um, Ilya, you have um, quite um, significant followership on Twitter, for example, um, including uh, the Western audience. How do you think, uh, what, what are your tips, let's say, your impressions, how to talk uh, to the West about the war? Um, to be honest, I don't think I'm in a position to give any tips, you know, <laughs> and advices on how to report on this, but I would suggest that we in Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian journalists, we uh, be less formal and more uh, personal. Uh, because as I can see from my audience, from the work that we do at the Kiev Independent, this personal view, this personalized view of, of a just the usual guy living in Ukraine, seeing all these things um, with his, his or her eyes, it works good in terms of uh, general Western audience uh, because, yeah, people from the West, uh, they know little about Ukraine and, you know, the life of Ukrainians, everyday life of Ukrainians. And as you show them that we are listening to the same music, we're watching the same movies, we wear the same, you know, dress of brands, uh, we have the same thing. So we speak more or less good English. So basically we are one, we are the same. We, we are, um, we belong to the Western world culturally and mentally and, in many regards, and we are the just uh, the same country as you, basically the same country as you, getting attacked uh, by a world's world's second military power, biggest military power, and uh, we are having the one of the worst uh, and largest wars in, in uh, human history since World War II. So obviously, this works well in terms of the Western attention because you know people people find it easier to sympathize. Uh, and to stick with, with us, uh, just because they finally, they not finally, they, they see that uh, we are not different uh, in, in this regard. So I would suggest that we have more personal personal take uh, on what's happening, but we stay journalists, truthful journalists uh, at the same time. So I would say that this works well for the West. I think that's very valuable. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, Roxolana, would you have uh, any comments on that? My colleagues said very good things, I think, and uh, I think that um, we just learn how to work in such conditions in practice. Uh, we just do our job. We show footages of shelling. We show the stories of survivors. Uh, we share our pain with the world. And uh, of course, we will never forget and forgive Russia for how this um death but uh, i think that we just show our life and we we should show our everyday life our life in basements our life life of our uh, people who are now uh, eat poorly or drink technical water or just like live underground um, we just show it and i think that that the best best way to show uh, to our western uh, friends what's happened in Ukraine. Thank you very much for all those insights. Um, May I just add one word? About, yes, of course. This thing. Uh, I just uh, wanted to add that, you know, it's a part of human psychology because people uh, find it easier to stick with a one just personal story of just one guy and girl in trouble rather than, you know, huge crowds and millions of people and lots of figures and statistics. This is just how uh, psychology works. So it, it works better for Ukrainian journalists to present personal stories of victims, just one family, one guy, one girl uh, getting in trouble in terms of, you know, uh, bombing, uh, Russian occupation, because personal, single personal stories work way better for, for people just, just because of human nature. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, this is what we also try to do at the ASNE versus Info to show personal stories of those who um, are at war. 
Um, let's hear it from our audience. Um, I can see uh, Donna Frosa wanted to, or Froze, sorry, um, want to ask a question. Please unmute yourself and, and feel free to ask your question now, Donna. Hi, uh, sorry, I'm calling in from uh, Hanoi and have been watching this. And there were sort of two connected questions that I had. Um, part of reporting, part of press is all about the stories that you're telling, but there's also how people receive those. And two things that I've sort of seen, I don't necessarily have any confirmation about them, is within um, Kherson, they have cut the internet so that it is only available from Russia. And so that's how do you get the information, the stories to the people? And then there was another story that I saw where in Mariupol, they were, the, the, the people weren't getting any current information. And so they had only a Russian version that said Kiev had fallen and um, that the, the war was almost over. And that's why people were choosing to go to Russia. And I'm just wondering how, as reporters, do you not only just write the stories that get people to read them, but get that information out to the people who need to hear it in Ukraine. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think partially we, we covered uh, the issue of uh, access to information uh, in the first part of our meeting, but but I think this is a very, very important question. So maybe I can ask first Roxolana and then Ilya to respond. Uh, yeah, it's true that uh, people in some parts of Ukraine now can can't see Ukrainian TV channels, but we also uh, have uh, our Telegram channels uh, so people can read information from the air or uh, can listen to radio stations. And uh, very many thanks to our volunteers who try to uh, send telephones uh, for people who now uh, without any connection and they try to help them and to tell the, them information and uh, send telephones uh, with uh, these telegram chats or with uh, normal con connection. And, but but Mariupol, uh, it's very difficult, really difficult uh, place now and uh, it's very hard to uh, to help these people. Ilya, any thoughts on your side? Yeah, uh, I wanted to say that uh, after these two months of war, I'm still really surprised about the fact that we in Ukraine we still have uh, internet connection, phones and TV, uh, any any other sorts of communication that we, they were not destroyed by Russia and we, we as a nation, as a country, were not cut off the world internet. So it, it, it was a big surprise to me because I expected Russia to cut us off any connections, any ties with the world uh, and uh, do do its thing here in Ukraine. But speaking of the information access to places like Mariupol and Kherson, yes, it's, it's a huge trouble. It's a problem, not uh, and it's the same goes about Bucha, and, but uh, I would say that even in places, places like Mariupol where phone connection is very not stable, it's very hard it's very problematic, it was even more problematic uh, a month ago uh, when the hostilities were in the in the worst heat. But uh, I, I, I would say that people, uh, one way or another, they find a way to deliver the world to their relatives uh, outside the city. Uh, I have this personal because, uh, you know, I have spent five years as a student in journal is in, um, in, in Mariupol. So obviously we have dozens of friends and relatives and, uh, and acquaintances in that city, even flatmates. He, he, he's got half of his family in Mariupol. So over these weeks, uh, for instance, my flatmate, he spent several weeks not knowing anything about his sister, if she's alive or not. But they somehow managed to find some traces of connect phone connection with the, uh, or internet connection over some you know, spots in the city that are still available. So people try to find a way to deliver some word. The same goes about Kherson, for instance. Uh, and in terms of reporting, yes, we do have a lot of trouble in terms of, you know, Getting getting our eyes on what's happening uh, beyond the uh, Russian occupation zone, um, but uh, many people still manage to flee uh, Kherson, Bucha, and uh, with the help of things that they told us uh, in Bucha, for instance, in terms of you know manhunting in Bucha and other places, 
they managed to bring a, a very important information from there. Same goes about Kherson, same goes about Mariupol, for instance. We have learned a lot about the so-called filtration camps, uh, Russian filtration camps in Mariupol, in Donetsk Oblast, uh, from the words of the regular people who have seen this, because other than that, you just can't, uh, you just can't get any, I mean, more or less reliable, uh, truthful information. So I would say that no matter what, the truth always finds me to get out uh, one way or another. We have seen this in, in this uh, in this work crystal clear. Thanks. That's a fantastic conclusion. Uh, thank you very much, Ilya. Uh, we need to wrap up the discussion as we are um, over the time that we have foreseen. Um, but I would like to ask uh, all three of our guests for um, final remarks. Um, and I want to ask the question, um, what can we do here on our end uh, to support you, to support independent media? Uh, let's maybe start with Oksana. Please rise in support of independent media, not only in Ukraine, but also in your country, because free media and independent media and pluralism is the protection, is the defense from dictatorship. And it is also protection of human lives. Please support safe work of journalists, those who work in Ukraine, those foreign journalists who arrive here to document and they work in really very risk conditions. And thank you everybody for your interest and for your support. For us, it is very important that the world knows what is going on in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oksana. Um, Ilya? Uh, yes, you know, there's this special thing about the Ukrainian media market. Uh, in pre-war times, and right now it's even more complicated. You can't make easy, easily. You can't easily make money from um, advertising because, as as a media, as an independent media, as an independent media, you depend on someone with a lot of money um, just to survive as the um, as a media outlet. And you know, not many media outlets in this country are profitable. And we, I, I was talking about the pre-war situation. Let's call it pre-war situation. Right now, it's even more complicated. So. How can we support the international, um, not necessarily international, but free media, independent media here in Ukraine? Just donate. I, you know, from my personal experience, you know, our professional experience uh, with the Kiev Independent, because we were established as the uh, independent media that serves no other than, you know, the community. It works. Just public support from many people uh, who donate, uh, who send money. Uh, who subscribes on, on Patreon, who uh, enlists to go fund me campaigns, who just uh, send the tips, you know, the, uh, the worth of, uh, you know, a, a coffee cup a week, as simple as that. That's a very little contribution for an individual human being, like $5 a month, for instance, $10 a month, uh, and we're talking big numbers. But if we have a situation when a lot of people, thousands, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are ready to need a cup of coffee, for the sake of independent media, it works. It really, really works. And hope that uh, this situation, we will end up having a very different media market in Ukraine, here in Ukraine, because as the this uh, war has shown, uh, independent media works. Uh, it's not that as you donate to um, to journalists, you donate to someone who's lazy, not working at the plant, um, the, just because you know the journalism matters. It exposes war crimes. It shows uh, what aggressive nations do. Uh, it just keeps your eyes open of what's happening uh, in the world so that you'll be ready to uh, prevent this threat from your countries um, in the very beginning, like what we have here in Ukraine. Journalism matters. So if you want to really support this thing, just do not hesitate to donate. Just donate the, the amount of money worth of just a cup of coffee every week. So this is the best way to support journalists here in Ukraine and beyond, uh, beyond, the, beyond Ukraine. Across the world, we have lots of independent media outlets. So yeah, just donate. Thank you. We heard this loud and clear. Uh, Roxolana, the final word goes to you. Yeah, uh, thank you for all your support. Thank you for your pro-Ukrainian values. Uh, it's really very necessary for us. Uh, write and speak about Ukraine in your countries. It's very, very necessary because 
it's uh, your thoughts uh, can be heard by other people and it's really necessary and read uh, the UAPBC uh, read the western media ignore Russian propaganda think critically uh, ask Ukrainians about what is happening in Ukraine and about Ukrainians now Ukrainians don't have time to be weak everyone first think uh, think about uh, what to do to win uh, and what to do for our victory and only then think about himself so uh, please you can help us uh, with your voices thank you Thank you very much. Thank you, dear audience, for being here uh, for this hour of very insightful uh, and important uh, discussion. Um, please remember about this cup of coffee when you when you buy another one um, and about the money that you could also use to support independent journalists. Um, thank you very much for the EAS and EU versus Disinfo colleagues for organizing our discussion. And most importantly, thank you very, very much, Roxolana, Ilya and Oksana for being with us, for um, devoting some of your time to share your very valuable insights. You are heroes of this war. We commend your work and we will keep supporting you. Thank you very much for being here.